president of Bombay Orthopedic Society to welcome the judges and the candidates. Over to you, Darsha. Good evening. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, and good evening and welcome, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome you all for this second round, which is sort of a semi-final of this uh, exciting new event which we have started, uh, which will ultimately culminate in the finals in Bayrock, where we'll have four or five finalists vying for the Rising Star title. So today we have, uh, I think, five uh, delegates uh, who are presenting their work. And uh, we have uh, uh, judges in the form of Dr. A.R. Karakhanis, a senior veteran orthopedic surgeon who is uh, a great teacher and uh, we always love him and his uh, insights into orthopedics and teaching. We have with us Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan, my good old friend. Uh, he's a well-known pediatric orthopedic surgeon practicing in Pune. He has consented to be there today for the judges. And we have as our good old friend, Dr. Deerin Ganjawala, who is going to be there as the judges. So welcome, all of you. Uh, thank you very much for taking your time and letting uh, judging this event. And welcome to the, all the new delegates who are vying for this final round. And I hand it over back to Ashok for beginning the proceedings. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now I'd like to invite Dr. Neeraj Vijlani, Secretary of Bombay Orthopedic Society, to introduce the candidates. What do you, Neeraj? Yes. So today we have five candidates who have made it to the second round of the BOS Rising Star competition. Uh, there are There is Dr. Mudit Shah, who is going to speak on neglected lateral condyle fracture, current concepts. Dr. Rudra Prabhu, who is going to speak on lateral elbow tendinopathy, a review of the current literature. Dr. Sushant Srivastava, he is going to talk on 3D printing in orthopedic trauma, where are we and what needs to be done. We have Dr. Jeshwant Netaji, he is going to be talking on TTO, tibial tubercle osteotomy, in difficult primary complex and revision total knee replacement. And we have Dr. Sheenam Bansal, she is going to talk on brachial plexus birth palsy sequelae. With this, I hand over back to Dr. Ashok to start the proceedings. Thanks, Dr. Neeraj. And welcoming all the judges and candidates again. Let's start with the first candidate. Dr. Mudit, is your Wi-Fi set up? We can start with you. Yeah, yeah, I, I can start, sir. Okay, go ahead, share your screen. The presentations are of eight minutes, followed by question and answer. So I'm going to time the presentation and announce the time at the end of your presentation. Go ahead, share your screen. Okay, go full screen. Yeah, is my presentation visible? It's visible and you're audible, you can start. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Mudit Shah. So today I'm going to talk about management of neglected lateral humeral condylar fractures in children uh, and discuss about the literature review that has been uh, published uh, preferably in the last 15 years. So I'm going to discuss what is the definition of a neglected lateral humeral condylar fracture, what is the problem associated with these uh, fractures and identify these problems, what are the current available solutions and can we define an algorithm for treatment of these fractures. To define a neglected lateral condyle fracture, first we need to understand that an acute lateral condyle fracture is a fracture which is less than three weeks old. A fracture which is three weeks to three months old is called as a delayed union lateral condyle fracture. And fracture which is more than three months old with no signs of callus formation is said to be a non-union or a neglected fracture lateral condyle. There are some papers which do mention two months old as the cutoff for calling a fracture neglected or a non-union. However, we are going to take the sentinel paper from 1975 defined by J.C. Flynn, who said that more than three months old is where we consider it to be a neglected fracture. Now, the incidence defined in a systematic review of a neglected lateral condyle fracture is 1.4 of all lateral humeral condylar fractures, which constitute about 16 to 20% of all elbow fractures. Now, to identify the problem, we need to know that what history has been teaching us about this. So, Flynn et al. in JPO 1979, uh, 1989 said that he sh we should not perform any kind of surgery when there is an ununited fragment in a po uh, poor position as it probably requires major dissection. 
Roy et al. in 1991 recommended a functional reduction in which the lateral condylar fragment is placed in a position that yields maximum elbow motion, which we will come to later, what we mean by functional reduction. And Gaur et al. in 1993 suggested technique of making multiple uh, incisions in the common extensor aponeurosis for aiding reduction, which means basically pie crusting and trying to aid the reduction to get a better position of the fragment. Uh, now, this paper from uh, International Orthopedic Sikot 2015 from Thailand uh, wanted to address whether we should repair any non-union of the lateral humeral condylar fracture. Now, this was a, a paper with 17 um, patients and uh, they said that, you know, osteosynthesis should be done for all children, not just for the pain, but for asymptomatic ones as well. Now, anatomical reduction is not essential, they said. A a good position should be accepted, which is the functional reduction. Now, functional reduction means that if we have a non, uh, non-union non neglected lateral condyle in this position, we try to bring it in the most, uh, in, in a position where if we insert two wires and temporarily we insert two wires and we check the motion of the elbow on table. And if it is an acceptable range, which is generally mentioned to be around 20 degrees to 120 degrees on table, we accept this and fix it with a screw. The, uh, the paper had actually three AVN preoperatively, and they said that after we fix the fractures, the AVN has been uh, corrected and there was no AVN in the last follow-up and the elbow joint incongruity was able, uh, they, were, they, were, they were able to see some remodeling, in fact, in the elbow joint incongruity after fixation in these skeletally immature patients. They said in the natural history that if treated, deformity and instability can be prevented because they have seen that 28 months after injury, the elbow function gradually tends to decline. So neglected lateral condylar fractures is a double-edged sword. On one side, we have a surge. If we do a surgical treatment, it can cause a decrease in elbow range of motion or stiffness, and it can cause an osteonecrosis or AVN of the fragment. As we know that the blood supply to the lateral condyle is from the posterior lateral aspect and any kind of excessive dissection can lead to an EVN of the fragment. But if left untreated, it leads to elbow instability, reduced uh, elbow range of motion. It can lead to some pain if there is more fragment proximal uh, migration. And in long term, it leads to a cubitus valgus deformity, may or may not be associating with the tardy ulnar palsy. Now, what are the currently available solutions? Management is controversial. I have gone through a lot of literature from India, China, uh, from uh, Korea and Italy. And they. Uh, I have tried to come to a treatment algorithm saying that if the fracture is three months to one year post injury, there is an option of going for an anatomical reduction, which is an open technique with fixation or an open technique with fixation and bone grafting or going for an in-situ fixation with bone grafting, which can be a peg graft taken from the proximal uh, aspect of the olecranon, or an iliac tricortical graft. They can be an in-situ fixation without bone grafting. Now, ulnar nerve anterior transposition with or without corrective osteotomy for cubitus valgus can be used as and when indicated, but generally they are not seen one year uh, within one year post-injury, and they are more of a late complication. So if... Uh, the only deformant, only problem with the patient is a lateral bump with a normal uh, nerve in no instability and good ROM. Probably a non-operative or an observation can be done. If there is a good range of motion with a deformity which is acceptable, but there is an instability, it will require osteosynthesis. That will improve the elbow stability and provide, uh, probably reduce the pain during heavy work. It prevents any deformity and a tardy ulnar nerve palsy. However, any osteosynthesis is associated with a chance of a stiffness and AVN if there is too much of dissection, and it might lead to non-union, specifically um, if, if not done in the most appropriate way. Uh, how, uh, to correct the deformity, if there is a deformity which is severe, the ROM is fair, but there is an instability, then it requires osteosynthesis with correction of the cubitus valgus. It is a technically challenging procedure which can lead to some secondary deformity and loss of range of motion in some cases. Now, can we define an algorithm? So, uh, less than one year, if there is elbow pain, instability, but there's a good elbow range of motion, 
in situ fixation is a preferable choice. If there is elbow pain instability with a poor elbow range of motion, we can aim for a good reduction or a functional reduction. There, uh, I what I could infer is that if there is a gap of more than one centimeter between fragments, a bone graft is to be used in such cases. When we talk about late complications, when I have gone through the uh, numerous articles, they said that if it is more than one year, then pain and instability probably are the uh, factors that come in in the early first three to four years. After that, deformity and ulnar nerve palsy is the major problem. So we go for an in-situ fixation with osteotomy and ulnar nerve transposition. However, if deformity and ulnar nerve palsy is the problem, then we go for an osteotomy and ulnar nerve transposition only. What are we lacking? Uh, most papers do not have a homogeneous study population. Neglected song 5 has not been addressed in most of these papers when the fracture is completely rotated and displaced. There are only 450 cases of neglected LHC that have been re reported till early 2022 and no study has a mean follow-up of more than 5 years. There is no clarity on use of bone graft as a mechanical or a biological agent and most papers do not assess the grip strength in the functional assessment of late neglected fractures. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mudit, and you finished exactly on time. Uh, I'd like to invite the judges now for questions. Kakani, sir, you are around? Yeah, so uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Go ahead. So uh, what is uh, the classification, medial to the crista, lateral to the crista? What do you have to say on that, uh, Mudit? So, uh, sir, the Milch, uh, the classification that uh, most papers have used is the Milch classification to define it type 1 and type 2, which is lateral to the trochlea and medial to the trochlea. And uh, there, there was one paper which mentioned about the fact that Milch type 1, since it is kind of an uh, extra articular fracture, so they recommend uh, trying to fix that more than doing a corrective osteotomy. So they said Milch type 1 should be, uh, you should do osteosynthesis and if required, you should do a corrective osteotomy and ulnar nerve transposition. However, Milch type 2, they recommended that it's not required to fix the fracture, but do a corrective osteotomy and an ulnar nerve transposition. That was the only paper so that spoke about the, uh, uh, you know, using uh, uh, the classification into a treatment protocol. And uh, that that is why I have mentioned in the in the limitations that uh, they have not, it's because it was not a homogeneous population, most of them were Milch 2. Mm. And have they said anything regarding examination of the patient under an, in the anesthesia in the operation theater to know what is the range of movement that is actually occurring at the elbow and what is the range that is occurring between the non-union? Because what exactly. will happen is when you fix that non-union, suddenly the patient will get stiffness. Have they said anything sir. on that? Sir, uh, thank you for the question, sir. Sir, um, I, I I think I should have mentioned that as a limitation of this uh, of uh, these papers that none of them have spoken about a uh, range of movement uh, under anesthesia. Of course, everyone has spoken about range of movement prior to uh, taking the child under anesthesia. Uh, lot, uh, about about uh, maybe about fifty percent of them have spoken about checking for instability under anesthesia but not mentioned about the range per se directly sir and, uh, they have sorry cm cm with cm no sir no sir none of them have uh, mentioned as per my uh, understanding mm. sir i might have missed something but as per my understanding mm. uh, none of them have mentioned about range under anesthesia mm. sandeep yeah. Go ahead, sandeep. nice presentation can you hear me yeah, yeah, yeah hear sir you. i can hear you yeah yeah so, a couple of points here. One is that, uh, like Dr. Karkhanis has said, though you did not find any evidence of examination under anesthesia before mm -hmm. surgery, does literature show that after fixing the non-union, is there evidence that you lose range? Mm -hmm. Because yes, sir. very often with our experience and my whatever understanding is there, mm -hmm. when you have a non-union of the lateral condyle, with valgus, there is a drift and there is actually a 20 to 30 degree flexion deformity, which is unmarked when you get it corrected. 
and that is manifest when the treatment is over it's not actual loss of range it was always there but it is not picked up people think it is full range of motion there is always okay. a flexion deformity if you bring it into axis so after fixation how many cases in these papers lost range of motion so uh, sir what i understand is that this was due to the range at the non union site uh, i mean the the trick there was a trick range at the uh, because of trick range at the non union site so that once we fixed it um uh, it was kind of visible or it came into purview at that point of time uh so there were uh, two papers one from uh, in fact one from india uh, by dr agarwal uh, by dr anil agarwal who said that uh, after fixation um immediately there was no mention about anything on table but in the post op he noticed that there was 10 to 20 degrees of loss of range uh, um i i don't remember clearly sir whether it was it was i'm sorry sir in which direction uh so in in flexion sir so you lose in flexion, flexion what you are saying yes. or you lose full extension no no so he yeah uh, so he lost flexion sir he lost flexion so flexion deformity uh, according to him improved but he lost 10 10 degrees of flexion if i if i'm not wrong okay okay yes, and sir. Uh, you want to ask another question, sir? No, Diren sir can ask. No problem. Diren sir, sir you're muted. Unmute yourself. You're you're mute, sir. Yeah, um, the really uh, wonderful uh, analysis of the review of uh, all the literature which is available on the topic. Now, based on that, can you tell us what are the directions in which the future research should go? So, what are the gray areas where still literature is not able to give us guidelines? so one is uh, thank you for that question sir one i i think is uh, there is not uh, any clarity on when to use bone graft and when not to use bone graft from what i understood is that if there it is uh, since it is a generally a hypertrophic non union because the um, uh, the uh, the lateral condyle fragment hypertrophies as well as the metaphyseal end has uh, you know hanging cartilage so uh, most of uh, when we use a peg graft a peg graft is i think used more as a uh, biological uh, uh, union factor but there were some cases who have used an tricortical iliac crest graft and uh, in 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 uh, my understanding it was used more as a mechanical um, graft rather than a biological union but there was not much uh, that was there is not much clarity as to why that bone graft was used and it is more i think uh, as per the surgeon's choice rather than any no, no. Uh, defined are, literature would there, there are japan there are papers from japan who have talked about the size of the graft and the size of the gap and where you should use it uh, yes sir sir more than 1 cm is when they said that uh, they would like to use it as a tricortical graft uh, yeah. but uh, but it's sir it's not whether it is a peg it's not mechanical you need to reconstruct the lateral pillar for stability when there is fibrous non union which is long duration right right sir if it is if it is a short duration non union with fragment in good position just roughening the pillar and putting in situ screw also will heal it agreed sir agreed sir agreed so so you have to look at the duration and resorption most all non unions are not hypertrophic there is a lot of resorption of bone also when there is a drift right so long standing asking, long yeah, standing uh, in india when you say neglect no if you read the indian and the asian literature our neglect means four years five years also people come late right right sir. their non union uh, is 16 weeks 20 weeks definition right sir their right, graft sir. is not needed but our non unions when there is resorption with big deformity if you correct deformity there is a gap right so that gap needs to be filled with bone if it is more than a centimeter right sir what kind of graft is in material but you need to put and it is only on the pillar you don't need to do it intra articular or metaphyseal right 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 just right, need sir. to fill right, the sir. pillar that is the pillar yeah yeah and fix it sir and fix it yeah. to, uh, with the screw correct thank you thank you sir thank you dhiran sir you are asking questions no 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 now let's go on to the next okay So Thank that's you, it for the presentation and
question answer session. Let's move on to the second candidate, Dr. Rudra Prabhu. Dr. Yes. Rudra, you can go ahead and share your presentation. Yes, sir. Okay, we can see your presentation. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, I My name is Dr. Rudra Prabhu. I thank the Bombay Orthopedic Society for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity. Uh, my topic today is uh, Lateral Elbow Tendinopathy, a review of the current literature. So, uh, what is LET? So, Lateral Elbow Tendinopathy is basically a gradual onset degeneration of the extensor tendons near the site of origin. And the commonest tendon involved is the extensor carpi radialis brevis. Uh, why is LET important? It is important because it can cause considerable social and economic burdens as people are disabled from working. Despite advances, there is still a lack of established standard of care and there is a considerable population which remains refractory to standard treatment. The objectives of my <clears throat> uh, presentation are to review the current literature regarding LET, to understand which non-operative treatments are effective and to understand the role of surgical management. Uh, I have done a PubMed search uh, and I've included original articles, randomized control trials, review articles, as well as meta-analysis. So is uh, this condition degenerative or inflammatory? It has always been called as lateral epicondylitis, but recent literature states that it is more of a degenerative process rather than an inflammatory process. A recent MRI study supporting this fact showed that 6% uh, of individuals between 18 to 13 uh, years of age had uh, MRI signs of LET, while these signs were present in 16% of individuals who are more than 70 years of age, uh, supporting the fact that this is more of a degenerative rather than an inflammatory pathology. Uh, this uh, condition originates in the ECRB. A cadaveric study done in 2014 supports uh, this by uh, showing that ECRB is in direct contact with the joint capsule and hence joint loads get directly transferred to the ECRB, resulting in its degeneration. Uh, now, uh, recent studies have also showed that there is a relation between LET and elbow instability. An MRI study published in 2013 included 24 elbows and uh, showed that injuries to the lateral ulna collateral ligament were more common in the group with severe LET. Another study in 2017 showed that out of 35 patients included in the study, 49 had at least one of the three arthroscopic signs of elbow laxity. Uh, the diagnosis of this condition is mainly clinical. Uh, the patients usually have lateral epicondyle point tenderness and a decreased grip strength. X-rays are used to rule out alternate diagnosis. Uh, the USG is the first line investigation. And uh, MRI findings are useful for selecting the patients for surgery. Coming to the treatment of this condition, uh, physiotherapy is the first line treatment. And although stretching exercises are the most commonly uh, advised exercises. Recent studies have shown that eccentric epicondylar muscle strengthening exercises are more effective and are recommended. There is no firm evidence regarding the use of physical modalities such as uh, uh, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation or shockwave therapy. Uh, literature says that only low level and high level laser therapies have shown to be effective. Uh, Counterforce bracing has always been used for the management of this condition. Uh, Counterforce bracing helps by inhibiting and dispersing the, uh, dispersing the stresses on the origin of ECRB, thereby facilitating its self-repair. An RCT compared bracing versus placebo and uh, concluded that bracing decreases the severity of pain and helps to improve the elbow function. Uh, corticosteroid injections are very commonly used for the management of this condition. However, literature advises against the use of these injections. Uh, a study published in 2016 included around 6,000 patients and uh, showed that corticosteroid injection might increase the risk of failure of non-operative treatment. Another study showed that the strongest predictor of failure of surgical treatment was patients who had more than three corticosteroid injections. Platelet-rich plasma injections have been recently tried for managing this condition and they have shown superior results. A review article uh, included six randomized control trials and showed that PRP injections had a beneficial role in the management of LET when physiotherapy was unsuccessful. Another RCT, including 156 patients, showed that a single PRP injection provided greater pain relief and better Mayo elbow performance scores than physiotherapy. 
there are innumerable studies uh, relating which uh, involve uh, the comparison of corticosteroids and prp in the management of this condition a double blinded prospective rct included 230 patients it was published in 2013 and it concluded that good outcomes were noted in patients who were treated with leukocyte enriched platelet rich plasma a similar study in 2015 included 30 patients and also concluded that uh, prp helps in biological healing of the lesion while corticosteroids have short term relief but it is associated with tendon degeneration this was a study which was carried out at our institute and published in 2022 it was a prospective triple blinded study which included 64 non athletes with let uh, the uh, athletes were divided non athletes were divided into two groups half patients were injected with corticosteroids while half patients were injected with prp the injection was given under ultrasound guidance and the outcome measures used were the was score dash score prte scores and the hand grip strength the study showed that corticosteroid injections had better results in the short term while prp injections had gradual but sustained improvement over the long term follow up uh, these graphs uh, show the trends with uh, the use of PRP and steroid. The blue line uh, is the uh, shows the VAS scores in the PRP group, while the red line shows the VAS scores in the steroid group. As per the graphs, there was improvement noted in both the groups in the initial period. However, in the long-term period, the VAS scores worsened in the steroid group, while they were still better in the PRP group. Similar trends were seen in the dashed scores as well as the PRTE scores. Autologous blood products have been recently used as well for managing LET. The analysis published in 2016 compared autologous blood products and corticosteroids. It showed that autologous blood products were more effective at restoring function in the intermediate term. Another meta-analysis in 2015 showed that autologous blood products as well as platelet-rich plasma were better when compared to corticosteroids in managing this, this condition. However, there was no statistically significant difference between autologous blood products and platelet-rich plasma. The only issue with autologous blood products was that they were associated with more side effects. Mm. The surgery is less studied. However, it has a significant role as well in managing this condition. Surgery includes open, arthroscopic, as well as percutaneous techniques. A retrospective evaluation in 2016 comparing open and arthroscopic surgery showed that both techniques were highly effective for chronic recalcitrant LET. Another comparison in 2018 showed that open surgery as well as arthroscopic surgery both yielded good and comparable clinical results. Uh, uh, a surgery which uh, compared arthroscopic debridement versus platelet-rich plasma was published in 2017 in the Journal of Arthroscopic and Related Surgery. It was a prospective comparative, uh, prospective comparative study and it concluded that arthroscopic debridement had better long-term outcomes in platelet-rich plasma. Also, uh, arthroscopic uh, uh, surgery for tennis elbow is associated with significant improvement in the pain and functional recovery in the short term as uh, seen by a study published in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery in 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, a recent advance used for managing lateral elbow tendinopathy is ultrasounded, ultrasound guided percutaneous genotomy, also known as UGPT. This uses the TX1 tissue removal system and is performed via 5mm incision. It uses ultrasonic energy to remove the disease tendon. Recent studies have shown that UGPT is safe and effective for chronic refractory LET and uh, it is associated with sustained pain relief and functional improvement at three years follow-up. Mm -hmm. To conclude, uh, the first-line treatment for managing this condition is epicondylar muscle strengthening and racing. If the first-line treatment fails, a PRP injection is useful and uh, it has better results if it is given ultrasound-guided. Uh, PRP stimulates repair by increasing the local concentration of growth factors, while corticosteroids mainly target the inflammation without modifying the natural course of the disease, and hence they provide improvement only in the short term, while PRP has long-term sustained relief. Surgery is to be considered in patients who have no response to conservative treatment and want a faster relief. However, the uncertainty mm -hmm. regarding the surgical procedures should be informed to the patient before providing them with this option. Uh, thank you for your patient listening. Uh, this is my; these are my list of references which I've used. Thank you, Doctor Rudra. Uh, you took around thirty seconds more to finish your presentation. Over to judges for asking questions. Karkhani, sir, you can go ahead. Yeah, uh, what is the importance of exercises? Because uh, you see, a patient comes with tennis elbow, and I have a personal experience. Level five, not published, but moment you start giving them theraband exercises in my clinic. At that moment, almost 60 to 70% of the pain is gone. And if they do it at home, 
they never come back with this. I have not given injection either PRP or uh, what is that steroids surgery left alone. So what is the literature on strengthening the exercises? That is very important. Yes, sir. Thank you for your question. Uh, sir, uh, exercises, especially eccentric loading, has been recommended as the first line treatment for uh, managing this condition. But uh, there is a significant group of patients who who do not have relief even after this. And uh, so for these patients, uh, mm. now NSAIDs were uh, traditionally used for managing this. But uh, as a literature has uh, suggested that this is more of a degenerative pathology and hence lateral epicondylitis has been mm. changed to lateral elbow tendinopathy. So the use of NSAID mm. is gradually decreasing and uh, there is a great proportion of patients who come back despite uh, having temporary relief, relief with physiotherapy. So for such patients, uh, the next uh, step is platelet-rich plasma injection more than corticosteroid injections. Exercises are definitely uh, helpful, but uh, still a great proportion of patients uh, still has complaints even despite... Uh, having physiotherapy. That is what the literature states. So what has used to happen is that I used to play tennis for my, as a tennis captain of Grand Medical College and I had a tennis elbow. That time we had those heavy rackets made up of wood, you see, where John Bogg used to play that time. And yes. one of the senior consultants told me, you take steroid. The other said, you get springs from Metro and I got springs and next day, from next day, the tennis elbow is gone. So what is happening now, the tennis elbow is, now they used to have this backhand, which was by one hand. But now you have a double-handed uh, backhand. So therefore, tennis elbow in tennis players itself is quite less. Is there any literature on that, on backhands? Yes, uh, actually, tennis it is called as tennis elbow because it was seen uh, in tennis players who were playing the single-handed backhand. That is how it originated. Mm. But... Uh, it was uh, it was just present in about ten percent of uh, uh, tennis players who uh, played tennis, and uh, uh, it had it. The origin was because of this condition, but it is present in a lot of uh, non-tennis players as well. Mm. And uh, yes, that is uh, regarding the uh, it, uh, uh, the term. What is the incidence of women to men? You find a lot of housewives do come with tennis elbow. And there are a lot of people who are manual laborers who have tennis elbow. Now, these two are two different entities. What is the literature on that? Yes, sir. Uh, especially in uh, females uh, uh, who have a lot of household work, like uh, uh, the uh, they perform a lot of household work, which involves uh, stretching of the elbow, elbow muscles. And mm. so uh, that is why it is more in... Uh, uh, mainly uh, household wives as compared to uh, when you consider males to females. Otherwise, there is no uh, significant difference uh, when we consider gender. In, uh... No, not that way. The, what happens is they have as extensively weakness of the extensor carpi radialis brevis, the women, whereas the manual laborers have been working and therefore they have a different entity. So these are the ones who will respond to either steroids or PRP, whereas the women will respond to strengthening exercises. So what is the difference in the literature on that? So, uh, Manual laborers, exercises may not help. Anything on that as compared to women who are housewives? Uh, so I did not find any specific literature regarding this uh, exact mm. point, But mainly uh, this condition is commoner in uh, females who are working uh, more uh, as a uh, as a part of uh, uh, more housewives, basically more common in housewives as compared to females who are not who are involved lesser in household activities, and in manual laborers again uh, repeated uh, exertion of the elbow muscles uh, is what is responsible for this condition. Otherwise, not I could not find any specific literature regarding your uh, question, sir. So have they asked, said anything on the PRP? How does it act? What platelets have to do with degeneration of the muscle over there or tear? Yes, sir. yes. Sir. There is a, a lot of mm. uh, literature regarding this. So, uh, the main thing is platelet-rich plasma helps to improve the local concentration of growth factors at the site of the pathology, while mm. corticosteroids uh, just help to tide over the initial wave of inflammation. So, uh, corticosteroids will definitely give uh, better relief in the short term, but platelet-rich plasma will help to uh, will provide a biological healing of the lesion, and hence it has sustained improvement. So basically, growth factors mm. such as PDGF uh, improve in, uh, at the local site. And since uh, the main pathology is degeneration of the tendon, the tendon fibers have worn out. Uh, mm. These growth factors help to uh, help in the regrowth of these uh, uh, injured uh, tendon fibers, thereby providing a sustained relief.
So is there any biopsy pre and post to show that there is a regrowth of the tendons which are degenerated? So there is not a biopsy, but there are USG guided studies which have shown that uh, with the ah. use of corticosteroids, the uh, no no not steroids, VRP. Yes, sir. There is there are uh, comparative studies using USG which have shown that uh, uh, long term for uh, at a long term follow up of two years, the uh, mm. wear and tear of the ECRB origin was worse in the corticosteroid group as compared to the PRP group. The PRP group had a better healing of the ECRB tendon. A biopsy study, I could not find a biopsy study, hmm. but definitely USG guided studies are there. USG, okay. USG has done, USG has been hmm. done in all over two years, which has shown hmm. a better healing of the ECRB tendon in the PRP group. As compared okay, to good. Group. Okay, Sandeep? Sandeep, you are mute. <laughs> Couple of questions to you, Rudra. Yes, sir. First is that outer side of the elbow pain is commonly caused as, called as uh, lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow as you were saying. But there may be other etiologies like proximal radial synovitis, radial nerve synovitis or some other nerve entrapment syndromes. Yes, so uh, we are focusing too much on treatment, assuming that it is a degenerative tear in the ECRL, ECRB. Yes, sir. So, what does literature have to say on proper diagnosis of what is actually the cause of the outer side pain and what is the pain generator there? Why does degeneration cause pain? Because unless there is inflammation, you don't get pain. Yes, sir. So thank you for your question. Sir, yes, there are, there are a lot of uh, differential diagnosis for LET. So although the initial, it is mainly a clinical diagnosis, uh, additional investigations such as USG and MRI are required before uh, starting a proper line of treatment for this condition. And uh, as you uh, as you asked regarding the pain generator, uh, there is more of a degenerative component in tennis elbow as compared to inflammatory, but still inflammation is uh, also an important component of this pathology. So, so that because is there a paper which says that they have done comparative MRIs in a lot of people, like you said, 16% above 70. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So all of them may not be symptomatic. There is no, all, all the patients people have bad looking knee x rays, but they don't have pain. Yes, sir. All the patients. So, yes, sir. when, when the patient comes for pain, how is one certain that we are there? So, do you recommend that every patient should undergo MRI? No, sir. Uh, so, first of all, the paper which uh, you just said, all the patients uh, included were normal patients. So, they were just uh, seeing in uh, it at, as a normal finding in that population. Yes. That's and secondly, degeneration, when you say is the cause of pain, a lot of asymptomatic degeneration will also be there. Right, right. So, if the degeneration is, then what is the pain generator? Because you are saying that there is evidence which says that healing is the long term results are better. Corticosteroid is a short-term analgesic effect, anti-inflammatory effect, after which you should do physiotherapy yes, for sir. strengthening and healing. It is a temporary form of pain relief. That's all. Yes, sir. It's not uh, like as if steroid is healing the lesion. It is yes. giving pain relief. That's all. Yes. yes. So, if it is purely degenerative, from where does the pain come? Yes, sir. It is mainly degenerative, but there is still some component of inflammation which is involved. So, that might be the source of uh, uh, pain in this condition. Okay. Forget that. Second question is, tell me that are there any PROMs, patient-related outcome measures? What is the patient satisfaction by after all this? Because most papers are written by surgeons who do those procedures. And they always are biased to writing out good results. Nowadays, more and more emphasis is laid on patient-based or patient-related uh, outcome measures. So, did you find any papers which say that a satisfaction study was done amongst patients who have undertaken, say, steroid or exercise? And what was their, uh, what what are the outcomes of those uh, kind of uh, papers? Yes, yes sir. So, uh, most of the papers have used uh, outcome measures such as the VAS score, the DASH score, and the PRTE score, and the use of hand grip strength. Uh, in my st uh, search, I could not find any specific paper relating to satisfaction. But mainly, there has been improvement in the VAS scores, uh, DASH scores, and PRTE scores with uh, PRP as compared to the uh, use of steroids. Okay. These are the scores which have mainly been used in most of the papers uh, relating to this topic. Achha, you have not made a mention of the Cousins test. How reliable it is for a diagnosis? Yes, sir. It is uh, definitely reliable because the main diagnosis, it has a, a sensitivity, I think, if I'm not wrong, around... Uh, 
60 to 65 percent of sensitivity but the main mm. diagnosis of this condition is clinical and uh, it, mm. it is definitely an important test to do before for diagnosing this uh, pathology mm. now uh, there is a paper long time when i used to take clinics in cooper hospital for pgs and that is uh, biopsies were taken of the tennis elbow and that was in a jbgs british yes sir. and they really found no inflammatory cells in that area so, what is the recent literature? Have they found any inflammatory cells? No, sir. Uh, may, the recent literature states that the cause is fibroangiomatous hyperplasia. That is the term which is used. Inflama inflammatory cells have not been found, but uh, hmm. there is still no uh, no paper which is com which is uh, which is stating that uh, there is no amount of inflammation which is involved in tennis elbow. It is so more that, therefore it becomes redundant to give a steroid. Yes, sir. Uh, that is what that is why steroids are even though they are commonly prescribed that is what the mm. recent literature is saying that they have they cause more harm than benefit so the trend is towards not using steroids although this is something which is very commonly used in practice but uh, the current guidelines are moving more towards prp and autologous blood products rather than the use of corticosteroids mm. okay yeah, uh, Rudra, you really explained. Uh, yeah, uh, you really explained well the mechanism of how the PRP works. Yes, sir. Uh, so that's a growth factor. Uh, can you tell us something about how autologous blood uh, injection works? Yes, sir. Just thank you for your question. So autologous blood products also have a similar role like PRP because it is also something which is uh, PRP is also uh, prepared from the patient's own blood. So similarly, autologous products. The only thing is. There is more cost which is involved in the preparation of PRP. The autologous blood products are comparatively cheaper, but the main mechanism is same. They also help to increase the uh, local concentration of growth factors in the local milieu. Main The main growth factor which is involved in uh, the use of PRP is platelet-derived growth factor, while uh, uh, other growth factors such as fibroblast uh, FGF is uh, mainly seen with the use of autologous blood products. But the mechanism is same. Both help in biological healing of the region. And uh, yes, yes, sir. And any comparison about the quantity of uh, growth factor which are present in autologous blood or uh, platelet rich plasma? Uh, so, uh, sorry, I'm not aware of that. The quantity exactly, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, thank so you. nice, uh, Rudra. Very good presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rudra, and thank you all judges for. Uh, Asking the question. So let's move on to our next candidate. Yes, sir. Yeah. So am I audible, sir? Yeah, you're audible, Sushant. Go ahead and share your screen. Yes, sir. So is the screen visible? Yeah. Yes, it's visible. Okay, sir. So a very good evening to everyone. I am Dr. Sushant Srivastava, and today I'm going to talk about 3D printing in orthopedic trauma. Where are we and what needs to be done? The topic 3D printing actually brings us to a mind of something as 3D or something which has printed. But that is not what it is. To tackle this issue and to know what exactly this problem is, we will see the history, introduction, uses in orthopedics, pearls of literature review, peek into the future and finally the references. So just dwelling a little bit into what this is all about. Way back in 1984, Charles Hull was the co-founder of the 3D system, which was basically a stereolithography. Now, this was a system for generating three-dimensional objects by creating a cross-sectional pattern of the object to be formed. In 1988, the fuse deposition modeling was done, which is currently most probably used 3D printing idea, which was done by Scott Scrum and was commercialized. Now, one needs to understand that once the patent expired in 2009, there was an exponential growth in the field with numerous low-cost machines being available to the end user. So, 3D printing is actually a rapid prototyping. The purpose was to create prototypes of industrial design in a quick and inexpensive manner. Additive manufacturing or layered manufacturing are the other terms for it. Computer control driven and hence it's a very accurate procedure. Currently, various technologies are present. The use of 3D printing in orthopedics is for preoperative planning, 3D printed implants, processes, splints, external fixators, surgical instrumentation and guides. And there are also 3D printed patient specific instrumentation. Now, what are the aims in fracture treatment? One, restoring the congruency of the articular surface. 
maintaining overall joint stability, achieving correct load distribution and gaining optimal joint function. Now, if you see a normal X-ray or a CT scan, which is done, the DICOM files are produced, which are processed through a mimic software. The segmentation of a region of interest is done. The virtual 3D model is prepared, which is converted into a STL file. And that STL file is used to make a full scale 3D model. For an example, a case which we had done, this is the case illustration of a preoperative X-ray of proximal tibia fracture. This is the CT scan. A CAD model was prepared. And using a 3D printer, we got a model. Now, there were a plethora of materials available in the market, but the most important one is the acronatrial butadiene styrene or the ABS. Commonly, there are multitude of orthopedic conditions used where we can use the 3D printed models. So when we have so many things going around, what does the literature say? So a detailed literature search was done where key terms of Boolean operators of 3D printing, orthopedics, trauma or injury was used where 815 results were found. Now, out of this, what majoritarily I found was there was a lot of articles in the last two decades by several authors. Way back in 1997, Kakil et al. found that rapid prototyping might be useful for teaching and surgical planning. Brown et al. in 2003 reported 3D printing helped in surgical planning and in reduction of exposure of radiation. And in 2020 by Gorino, he said that there was an improved placement of accuracy of pedicle and pelvic sues and therefore decreased risk of iatrogenic neurovascular trauma. Now, there are five sentinel papers in this topic which I have included. One is 3D printing and its application in orthopedic trauma, which is a technological marvel. This paper actually highlights the use of 3D printing in almost all possible fractures in the entire body. Another paper which talks about 3D printing applications in orthopedic surgery goes ahead and says about the planning and training, but also it addresses the large bone stock deficits which we have, especially for an example in this acetabular fracture. It also shows the versatility and effectiveness of 3D printing technologies. And the next paper talks about the 3D printed anatomical model, which is effective for the planning and performing the surgical treatment of complex articular fracture. It is also used as a navigation instrument. For example, in this Hoffa's fracture where this model is used interoperatively. The meta-analysis of orthopedic surgery and its application in traumatic fractures indicates that the operative duration, interoperative blood loss, the interoperative CM shoots and there were excellent outcomes in a 3D printed model as compared to a traditional surgery. A review article done showed that the three-dimensional printed technology can ahead go with the printing of customized human tissue organs and this living tissue and organ analogs can be used ahead. Now, this is the current scenario where we have a revolutionized 3D printing technique where you have anatomic model, model printing, patient-specific instrumentation, and jigs. When all this is present, what about the future? So having a peek into it, patient-specific implants are going to be the norm in the years to come, where revision surgeries and critical bone defects will be present. Tissue printing like cartilage and bone are at the moment in the realm of research. Further developments need to be keenly observed. A peak in the future is a very interesting thing coming up called as the four-dimensional printing. The 4D printing is going to use the same set of technology as the 3D printed model. Only one dimensional is allowing the printed part to change the shape over time in response to specific environment. And smart materials are going to be used to create self-reconfigure proteins, tissues, and organs. But how will all this come into play? There needs to be a partnership between the government, doctors, engineers, healthcare workers, patients, and the public. One of the most important and glaring examples of this partnership is BETIC in IIT Bombay, which has been doing this since the past 10 years, wherein many patients having defects in the bone, malignancies, trauma, are actually getting a 3D printed model done, made, prepared, and then being used. So what are the pearls of wisdom? The benefits of 3D printing include extreme flexibility to customize the shape, increased intricacy, complexity of manufactured products, elimination of assembly steps, waste and inventory reduction. But as always, there are a few disadvantages. Any new technology includes cost and lack of data, both of which are important to the economically strapped and litigious medical field regarding custom medical implants. 
patient specific 3d implant implants a new technology to successfully treat a variety of pathologies in the orthopedic surgery mm. these are my references thank you very much okay thanks uh, sushant uh like to invite judges for questions karkani sir go ahead so this uh, must be particularly useful for acetabular defects is it not yes, most sir, of the sorry. papers yes, yes sir, and sir, and sir. fractures of the acetabulum uh, fractures of acetabulum sir also for uh, used in uh, cases of intraarticular fractures like proximal tibia cases mm. of floating knee and there have been papers where they have used it uh, in uh, intraarticular fractures as well apart from acetabular fractures or bone defect fractures yeah so most of the papers must be on the defects which are there in acetabular where you require revisions or where the acetabulum is deficient either superiorly or medially is it not yes sir but that is just mm. a component of 3d printing that ah. is for bone defect majority uh, the mm. the research which is currently seen are the fractures that is the intraarticular fractures where they are using this as a preoperative planning or a simulation technique the bone yeah yeah so cost effective now if you see that uh, ct scan ct scan yes. itself is costing about 1200 1500 yes, what yes. is the cost of this 3d and is it what is the randomized control trial comparing 3d printing with ct scan okay sir so i and 3d ct scan Huh? Okay, so, yeah. so currently I have huh. not come. Thank you for the question. I've currently not come across any paper which is comparing hmm. the cost of a 3D printer, 3D printed model versus a CT scan or the total cost value which is taking care of. Majority of the studies which are there, they are actually using a traditional surgery which is done just with a 3D CT scan, which hmm. is compared to a 3D model, and the. basic specific points which they are talking about are decrease in the intraoperative blood loss there is a decrease in the cm shoots and also uh, increase in the uh, patient response outcome or the functional outcome of the patient so nowhere in the paper as far as i have concerned or i have seen the literature as of now have they mm. spoken about the cost but uh, to answer your point sir of course we have had personal experience in this wherein the 3d printer it cost somewhere around 2 to 3 lakh rupees and it actually is procured by an engineering institute and mm. also uh, the model which is prepared it comes somewhere around 1000 to 2000 rupees so it's an additional cost of 2000 to 3000 rupees to the patient but it is very mm. useful in cases where there are old fractures places where uh, you have defects in those conditions so how does it reduce blood loss and the duration of surgery yes sir so what compared to 3d happens, ct yeah so what what actually happens is uh, majority mm. of the times when a doctor he asks for a 3d printed model you can actually preoperatively operate on that model and so with that you can actually mm. have a pre contoured plate you know what type of mm. what size of screws you can use in it so mm. you have actually done the surgery preoperatively straight away and then you just mm. have to go in and do it so in that way the number of cm shoots the number mm. of the amount of blood loss is decreased that is how they are tackling this okay sandeep sandeep patwardhan yes sir sorry ha ah, so, bolna sushant uh, good good evening sir thank you evening uh, just a little see i agree that this is a very interesting and a new uh, surgeon aid Yes, sir. or uh, uh, it's like simulating the surgery preoperatively on table on a model. Yes. Sir. What is the time lag between getting that model made and doing all this vis-a-vis -vis operating on the patient? Because okay, as you are wasting time and money and expense, because we are talking of applications in trauma, right? Sir. Not in, uh, tumors or reconstructing defects. right so in a trauma surgery in a periarticular or an intraarticular comminuted fracture okay right, what is the time frame what does literature say that how quickly do you get it that is first question second right. is i assume most of these papers are funded researches by either engineering institutes or 3d printer makers uh is there a clinical paper which has said that they have used this 
in each and every case in a series of so many patients and they have found there is a learning curve what what is the clinical implication paper on the right sir thank you sir for your question uh, coming first to your question of uh, the time lag sir now as you have rightly pointed out sir any intraarticular fracture or a periarticular fracture or anything which comes vis-a-vis to the general term of trauma it needs to be tackled as soon as possible which is absolutely correct but uh, as compared to the time lag the ct scan which is done on the day of trauma that dicom file can be procured straight away and the printing takes less than 10 hours so you can have a model with you within one and a half two days now these are these are done at institutes and at places which have had certain amount of understanding with an engineering institute or a third vendor party which is doing that for them acha also coming to the point where how much it is going to make any difference or uh, how well this is going to be unbiased study so there are many studies sir which actually there are pa- uh, papers from hong kong there are papers from south korea and china as well where the department itself has a 3d printer with them and they have mm-hmm. actually gone ahead done this and clinically shown with their papers as to how beneficial this is secondly coming to the point of fractures which need immediate a uh, consideration or immediate uh, operative uh, uh, thing which needs to be done so the only point of me pre- uh, presenting this paper was to actually sensitize the population that there are printers which are giving us uh, the printed models within 6 hours there are small printers as well you can have something called as a miniature 3d size model wherein you just see what is wrong you can actually pre operatively just do a half an hour or a 45 minute simulation on it and then just go into your or straight away because as it is as we go from x rays there was no ct scan before and all of a sudden we had a ct scan and then it made things very simple for us so Correct. hopefully but what i'm just asking you is that see yes, with vr coming in virtual reality yes sir okay, you can do a vr surgery using a 3d ct and get a feel of how you are going to achieve that reduction Yes. Why sir. do you actually physically need to print a model? Ultimately, it is a surgeon's imagination and skill. He just right. needs to orient his mind to the fragments and the anatomy in a better way. Yes, it's sir. like That's a Lego. Nice. You are creating a Lego and practicing on it, and then doing the surgery on patient. Yes. In sir. the hope that, is- that you get better reductions, lesser blood loss. I agree. It's it's absolutely a good tool. But then it may it may happen that it becomes a teaching tool. Yes, sir. Not so very well is... practical to be used when VR comes in, and you can do all this virtually. Yes, sir. So VR is one of the upcoming things in artificial intelligence, which is coming up, and that may completely make this thing of Operate, using a three yeah. D printing, using a three D printing to simulate the surgery preoperatively. That is one component. Manufacturing as... implants with three D printing and all is a different ball game yes. altogether. Yes, yes, yes. So that was a part of my topic, sir, and uh, I had shed some light about it. but okay. uh, it is not a full proof method completely just for uh, orthopedic trauma yeah. or just for making a preoperative implant yeah maybe with more and more uh, post graduate seats now most of the residents will operate on 3d models only that way it will be useful not on patient thank you so yeah shushant uh, yes, the all the indications which you mention are probably for the preoperative planning for yes, better sir. understanding the fracture geometry and all that what about the 3d implants the 3d printed implants yes sir so what is the status of that yes sir so uh, the thing is when we have actually done the preoperative simulation or the surgery and we have actually come to know the mold of the implant which can be used for this particular surgery it takes approximately 3 to 4 days to actually go ahead and make that implant now majoritily what happens is in local settings which is there we can actually go ahead and ask for a pre compute plate now for example a proximal tibia fracture which we can actually go ahead and operate after 3 to 4 days because there is always a chance of swelling unless and until there is more amount of blebs and everything just giving an example for a proximal tibia fracture so pre compute plates and screws of a proper size can be obtained from the manufacturer and these takes approximately 3 to 4 days 
so taking a side of 12 hours of actually printing your model and 3 to 4 days of surgery so you are actually prepared to do a surgery in a case of a for example a proximal tibia fracture within 7 days which is with a with a good amount of time to do a proximal tibia as it compares to other fractures or the fractures of necessities there will be a challenge of procuring plates then and there with service within 24 to 48 hours so plate production actually requires around 3 to 4 days so that is one technique or there is that is one uh, drawback apart from a high cost uh, apart from being an added on investigation or added on cost for the patient or the hospital this is one thing which many of the manufacturers and lot of research has been going on as to really cut down the time yeah just a quick question like the 3d yes. printed implant are as strong as the implant which are made in a conventional way yes sir absolutely because they are using the same amount of material if it's a titanium based implant they are using a 3d printer which is having a titanium based component and they are making that implant no, so no. the material so it's is a the... titanium material but the basically yes, if you look at the technology it's a layer by layer uh, the yes, layers sir. are yes, added yes, while yes, the, if you look at the titanium plate they are yes, made sir. from a flat plate and then right exactly exactly sir. so that is a very pertinent uh, question and which is also lacking in the research that is they haven't checked for the durability and the feasibility and also the breakability of the implants which are 3d printed vis a vis the traditional implants there have been no such paper as much as, as according to my knowledge sir. okay thank you thank you sir uh, shushant i would like to have a question with you so as you mentioned in your presentation started in 1997 even before that 3d printing and the the revolution that happened in 2009 when it became public it is more than 20 years you said two decades and still there are no concrete indication for 3d printed implants or 3d printing technology i mean a concrete indication where you say this is essential okay you cannot do without there are no indication as per now in orthopedic not only in trauma anywhere where it says that 3d modeling is essential are there any if there are not then are we not putting too much of things into something that has not grown fruits for even after two decades uh thank you for the question sir i i knew sir this this is one of the drawbacks of this study because uh, the problem is uh, there are not enough uh, i would say there are a lot of papers which are actually giving you results which say that it's better in a few components but there have not been a cultural change in in in, in totality to actually say that this is a necessity so Absolutely. this is yeah so this is this is one of the things which is upcoming for sure and this is one thing I mean, which i mean if if it is upcoming for 25 years <laughs> i will have to think about it yes I sir mean, actually you see papers about new new in novel 3d printing and future which yes, are sir. the same titles that you used to see in 2007 2009 yes sir so now i guess mostly what would happen is that it has basically three wings 3d printing has three wings one is preoperative stimulation one is for teaching and other is for uh, customized made implants so research. maybe one i think, yeah, I, so, think i think research. most of the 3d printing things are used by universities or research groups yeah so, so published papers academia so, i think is isn't 3d printing limited more to academia than to clinical application it has, it has found more application in academia than in clinical practice what do you what is uh, your view about that sir see if you come to now the current market especially in india or in southeast asian countries not every uh, practitioner or a medical college will actually boast of a 3d printer with them okay so no, no, no. See, that suppose if if an oa or cm is essential for a surgery you right, will have so if if 3d printing establishes itself as a essential technique of course the mm -hmm. hospital will buy it. right so that is not a issue that is not the argument right. so, 
so the the only thing is uh, it's not an it's not completely a necessity when it comes to a treating a orthopedic trauma or a fracture mm -hmm. but being a subset of orthopedic training that is a uh, pre operative planning or simulation or also for teaching on patients now this is something which will completely take away cadavers now there are there are uh, changes or there are things which are happening where uh, there are a lot of companies who are coming up especially germany Krishan, and personal question what will you prefer yes, a cadaveric dissection with your own hands or a or a vr i would i would any day prefer a cadaveric dissection sir Absolutely. but also that answers also... everything i think i don't have any more questions and since the time is less let's move on thanks yeah, sushant thank and thanks thank everybody you, for questions Let's move on to Jashwan Netaji for his presentation. Share your presentation, Jashwan. Yeah, we can yeah. see, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. So good evening to the respective okay. faculties. Okay. I had a wonderful okay. presentation. Okay. Yes. Okay. My topic today is I am Dr. Jashwan from Ganga Hospital. I am an FNB in orthoplasty. Our my topic today is triple tubercle osteotomy in difficult primary complex and in revision thinking. I I would like to start this uh, presentation with this uh, quote: He who fails to plan. Is planning to fail. It is said by Wilson Churchill. Whenever we see a patient in our OPD, in today's day, we think what how it will happen after 15 years to the patient and what will happen immediately. These two things we see it in, uh, in an orthoplasty OPD. Interaction. TTO is nothing but an extensional approach for TK. It was initially, uh, it was been done in uh, starting of 19, uh, 1900s itself, but uh, more came into popularity in 1980s after this uh, after this publication of osteotomy of triple tubercle a technical note by Dorin EMG in the journal of bone and joint surgery it is used for adequate exposure in stiffness and uh, when there is an inability to dislocate a petala without the risk of patellar rupture and in revision knees and in cases in which after the releases after the lateral retinal column releases the patella is small tracking what an orthoplasty surgeon needs to know in, uh, in while dealing in stiff knee and revision knee, there will be a need for extensive extensive approach. Not always, but there are there are, there are fifty percent of chance that has been uh, there that we need an extensive approach. So we need to know it. Stiff knee. There are two types of stiff knees are present. One is stiff knee in extension and stiff knee in flexion. Usually, the stiff knee in flexion types or all flexes after the anesthesia, but stiff knee in extension or difficult cases which does not flexes after the which does not flex after an anesthesia. These are two cases which are primary called difficult complex primary knees. One on the left side is a rheumatoid knee, which had an uh, which will have an flexion of zero to twenty degree after anesthesia, and another one is an ankylosed knee. And these two knees definitely will need a different approach or an extensional approach. And these knees won't bend. The impact of stiff knee in extension. The stiff knee in extension is totally a different biomechanic, uh, biomech totally different. It has four components for stiff knee in extension in common. There will be additions between the petal and proplia, obliteration of the suprapetalar pouch, scarification of the muscles, and shortening of the rectus. In revision decay, if at all, we need to remove a well fixed stem in a case of infection of our female component loosening. We have to do an uh, extensive. We have to do an extensive release, and we have to uh, do an extensive given physical force to remove the stem. But with the use of a TTO, we can use uh, we can remove the stem plus cement easily. And if we try without an extensive approach, this will happen on the right side of the of the, of the presentation. There is a petal tendon rupture in which we encounter very common when doing a tight knees or when exposing a tight knee. The revision surgery is not a second time of primary implant surgery, but it is a very complex issue for, for an orthopedic surgeon to deal with in orthoplasty. What are the surgical approaches available? One is snip approach, cordyceps snips, and another one is inserts uh, cordyceps BY plasty, and third one is a tibial tubercle osteotomy. All these three comes with an different advantages and disadvantages. And contrasting literature is present on the functional outcome of, of the stiff knees and in the revision knees. And most of the stiff knees and most of the revision knees in the recent literature there is a rise 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 in the satisfaction level when uh, satisfaction level among the revision groups because of the improved implant constraint and improved improved uh, implant stability and there are two uh, seminal papers which was published in 2005 and 2017 by Dr. Ashwin Rajagopalan, only dealing with the stiff knees and ankylosed knee. And tibial tubercle osteotomy was uh, a key tool in these two papers for stiff knees in extension and ankylosed knee. 
and this TTO is very uh, less done all over the world. And because why is the reason? Because of this type of cases of ankylosed knee and full stiff knee in, uh, extension are very less and only seen in a developing or dev uh, developing nations. What is the aim of this uh, review? To assess the functional outcome and complications in patients undergoing total knee arthroplasty by TTO. My two main objectives is only two. One is to see the outcome and two is the complication. Because whenever we want to do a TTO, I want to know what is the complication when I'm putting a cutting a bone and putting a screw. My methods was it was an electronic database search by in COVID and COVID. And my level of evidence was RCTs, systematic review cohort and case control studies. The literature for stiff knee in extension is very less. And out of the five studies, two of the four, out of the five studies, three of the studies were from Indian population and two are from from Japanese population. And all this Indian population had the stiff knee with less than 30, 50 degree of range of motion and stiff knees with the full full ankylosis and stiff knees in extra and stiff knees in extension. And it is it is less commonly seen in developed nations. TTO and revision knee literature. The revision, uh, TTO for revision knees is uh, being published uh, recently and uh, uh, recently because of the use of the long stem. People put a long stem and fix it for a primary uh, primary revision. But when a patient comes for a re revision or third term re revision, fourth term re revision, we have to remove the stem and there is no other option. We wave plastic won't help. Uh, Quadriceps plastic won't help. Only option left is tibial tubercular osteotomy. The clinical outcome. Whenever uh, uh, what what is the importance of this clinical outcome in tibial tuberculosis osteotomy? Previously, it had been uh, not done by a routine, even a routine orthoplasty surgeon because of the fear of the screw pullout and the complications involved in intraoperative and immediate post-op. But recent literature has said that tibial tuberculosis osteotomy is a safe procedure and it has been, uh, it has been uh, advised as a best surgical approach and uh, technique of choice when done correctly. This is a recent uh, meta-analysis published in 2022 says that the uh, the K, uh, knee society score and the functional outcome is very good in the patients with the total uh, TTO when compared with quadriceps and uh, quadriceps strip VY plasty. Is TTO an approach for stiff knee in for approach in stiff knee? Yes, it is usually recommended in ankylosis in extension and stiffness in extension, uh, ankylosis in extension and stiffness in extension and pedal of because it increases the quadriceps length. Sometimes we proximalize the uh, proximalize, proximalize the uh, tibial tubercular fra fragment to increase the length of the quadriceps, which will aid in full uh, full extension and flexion. Extension lag. This is this is this is the reason why TTO came up because in quadriceps nip and quadriceps uh, VY tendon pasty. There will definitely there are, this is an RC, this study is an RCD published in COCR, uh, which uh, showed a definite decrease in uh, decrease in extension power extension power that is extension lag was present, uh, but it was not present in patients who had tibial tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. This was the only reason which TTO came up. TTO related complications are majorly intraop complications or tuberosity fracture, metaphyseal fracture, and MCL injury. Post-operative non-union of the fragment, implant failure, that is uh, screw bake cage, not the processes, and the metaphyseal stress fracture, which uh, occurs in the immediate post-op region. Complication rate. The complication rate for a TTO, which is published in 2018, is 20%, 20.9%. And in that uh, first complication is post tk stiffness is the most common cause. But the recent meta-analysis says uh, it favors, and some studies say it outweighs the, benef uh, it outweighs the risks. Risk benefit ratio. What is the conclusion? TTO is a valid and safe option in stiff knee extension and revision TK without compromising the power of extensor apparatus. Less post operative complication in recently published articles, that is after 2010. TTO is just an approach. By doing a TTO, it is not seen uh, shown in the literature that uh, uh, the uh, functional outcome will increase. Other than quadriceps VOA plus T, functional outcome is same for TTO. Long-term functional outcome is the same for TTO, quadriceps nip. Only quadriceps VY plastic has a decreased functional outcome in cases of revision. These are the references. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Jashwant. Uh, I think you finished on time. Yes. Over to Kakani, sir, for questions. What do you say? Uh, Jashwant, uh, good presentation. But uh, the last uh, line that you said that there is not much of a difference between tibial tuberosity uh, osteotomy and of the quadriceps snip, then why do that in the first place? Sir, it was in the long term follow up, sir. It was in the ah. long follow up, but three years, five years follow up, the 
a functional outcome doesn't make a difference but uh, the patients who recent rct says that the knee extension lag is not there in patients with ttu when compared with quadriceps nip and quadriceps vi plasty because quadriceps nip or vi plasty requires a brace in the post operative period mm. for of the tendon tendon to tendon mm. healing in ttu also we give but it is for very short duration of 4 to 4 weeks sir mm. so does the literature say that after you do the uh, tibial tuberosity osteotomy and when you put all the implants, is it possible that the tubal tuberosity osteotomy will not come into that place? It might go proximal to what the osteotomy is because of the implant and because of stiffness. And yes, sir. along with that, excuse me, along with that, do you require quadriceps snape or a VY plasty to bring the tibial tuberosity back into place? No, sir. Proximalization of the tibial tubercle fragment will... While suturing, aid... while suturing, but... while fixing back. Yeah, proximalization of the tibial tubercle, uh, tibial tubercle fragment will effectively increase the quadriceps exertion, sir. It is described in the literature for proximalization of one centimeter. It will increase the quadriceps excursion, sir. And we don't uh, do a quadriceps snip along with the TTO because it will, uh, it, it will, uh, it will bring more da damage to the extensor apparatus. Yes, sir. Agreed, but if it is in, uh, sir. Uh, bola. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. <coughs> I had the same question. If there is a fixed length of the quadriceps, which is shortened and your knee is stiff in extension, mm. right? Unless you change the joint line itself, that means you are taking your femoral cut too proximally. How does one achieve length to get flexion? Mm. Otherwise, what Dr. Karkhani says that your tuberosity is going to move up or you have to lengthen the quadriceps proximally. Yeah, we move yeah. it, sir. Move it up. So you yeah, have so to move it up, no? So it is not yeah. anatomical fixation again, or then femoral joint line is going up. No, sir. We are not. Uh, we have to proximalize, sir. Ah, no, so see, that's what it doesn't go back to its original place. So it doesn't yes. go back. We have to proximalize it. Sir. So what are the implications of that in the long term on the biomechanics of a total knee replacement? Because you have changed the insertion. Yes, sir. We are changing the insertion slight. Patella, that will also uh, cause equal lag because patellar tendon is now shortened and lacks. Yes, sir. <clears throat> That's so why. Uh, yeah. What I am trying to say and what uh, Sandeep is saying is the same thing that if there is a quadriceps contracture in extension, when you do a tibial tuberosity and when you put the implant, the, everything is going to be short. So what is happening is that tibial tuberosity may not be able to be sutured at that same site of the osteotomy, yeah. in which case is it possible that it may go into non-union and all those things because it is not in its uh, printout uh, fixation, footprint. No, sir. No, sir. When we do a tibial tuberculosis osteotomy, only the middle no, What does the literature say? This uh, seminar is for literature, not on your experience. What do they say? Yeah, they say 10% of non-union is there, sir. No, no, but proximal. Whether it is possible, you can't fix it in the same site. That's what we have no, to sir. worry about. No, fix How it. much proximal does it have to be fixed, whether it ah. causes loosening of the patellar tendon, that means infrapatellar part of the, uh, the patellar tendon becomes flaccid because you have moved yes. it up in attempt yes, to sir. gain flexion and whether yes, that lag has any effect on the long-term biomechanics and survivorship of the knee. No, sir. Uh, uh, literature, I haven't found that uh, long-term outcome, sir. Because most of the published literature, the maximum published literature is 15 years by Dr. Rashad Rajagopalan. In that, it has not been mentioned, sir. But uh, we pro uh, it has been proximalized in all the cases in which they are mentioned. Yeah, you have sir. to. You have to. It is mentioned, sir. I didn't find literature because literature, stiff knee in extension, the total number of articles which I found was 5, sir. Out yeah, of I, we three, saw that three of them are Indian and there is no long-term study. Yes, sir. So uh, I want to ask you, Jaswant, uh, that why is it that we have got Indian things that is happening for tibial tuberosity, whereas thousands and lakhs of uh, revisions are going all over the world. They have not had this type of exposure for those cases, except for India and the Southeast. What is happening yes, in the Northern Hemisphere? Oh, the Indian, uh, yeah, the Indian, the literature which I said for the Indian subcontinent is for stiff knee, so stiff knee in extension. The other in uh, other recent publications for Russian TKR in for stem removal, they routinely used a tibial tubercle osteotomy, sir. Tibial stem sorry. removal. Sorry, can you just repeat because some call came for me? Yeah, sir. Actually, the 
Indian reference which I gave is for ah. stiff knee in extension, sir. Correct. Ah. Yeah. The tibial tubercle osteotomy is widely being done in revision total knee arthroplasty in Western for yeah. removal of the long stem tibial well fixed long stem, sir. Ah. It has been used, sir. So what are their results? The results is good, sir, when compared to quadriceps nip and quadriceps rewi plasty. The result in terms of KSS and KFS are good when compared to uh, quadriceps nips and uh, quadriceps rewi plasty. So that is case series level 4 or level 1 RCT was it? What is it? Level 3 evidence, sir. It's a retrospective study. Mm. Okay. Because I have no more questions for you now. Anybody else? Yeah, just one. Uh, just uh, uh, one question. Uh, instead of doing a tibial tuberosity osteotomy, why not to carry out a lengthening or the procedure at the patellar tendon? I'm not talking of doing anything at the quadricep level because that will definitely lead to quadricep inhibition and weakness. But doing a procedure or like uh, something like a Z uh, plasty of uh, patellar tendon and that gives the equally good exposure and Everything we can do it, what we are doing with tibial tuberosity. And if you require Z lengthening, that will also give something similar to what we do it with proximal, uh, proximalization of the tibial tuberosity. Sir, uh, I haven't read uh, any literature and I heard about it, sir. But uh, thing what, what is my understanding is uh, tendon to tendon healing is very long. And then the tendon injury is more, tibial tendon is very short and stout. And in the cases like this, it will be already in revision knees and all. It already the tendons will be uh, damaged. And trying something over the patellar tendon will definitely result in uh, rupture. What I feel is, but literature I haven't uh, seen it, of, sir. This procedure. Thank you. So I think just one. Then it is possible that if the patient, the arthroplasty surgeon is finding that the knee is stiff, and probably he has done a quadriceps snip, and something is not happening. Instead of rupturing the tendon, it's better to do a tibial tuberosity osteotomy. Sir, but... Uh, yes? Uh, uh, sir, in literature, I haven't read about uh, both uh, quadriceps nip and uh, tibial tuberosity osteotomy, sir, done simultaneously. You mean to say that blindly you should do a tibial tuberosity osteotomy without even trying the quadriceps nip? In the no, literature, I am not talking about your experience because this is on literature review, no? What do you say? No, sir. I didn't find out like that, sir. Protocol. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. There, sir. You have any questions? No, no. No, sir. Okay. Okay. So, thank you, Jeshwan, for the nice presentation. Thank you for the views. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Sir. Let's move thank on you. Thank to you. next next uh, candidate, Dr. Shinam Bansal. Please share your screen. So we have uh, three Shakti now today. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we can see your presentation. Go ahead, making it full screen. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, presenting on sequelae of brachial plexus but palsy. Yes. Go ahead, Sheena. Brachial plexus but palsy is the flaccy weakness of the upper limb that occurs as a result of traction to the brachial plexus. Its incidence is 0. 0.4 to 4 per thousand. Incidence has not changed despite an increase in rate of C-section. 10% patients have permanent weakness. Atypical postures can be seen in proximal humeral physal separation, clavicle fractures, and uh, uh, radial nerve palsy. Botulinum toxin for the treatment of core contractions have been described in the literature. One patient, th this is a comparative study between uh, bot Botox injection in biceps and triceps. One patient showed no response to Botox injection in bicep and no uh, and didn't develop anti-gravitational strength. This is a study uh, published in 2014. Local Botox injections can be beneficial except for those with a considerable passive range of motion limitation. Uh, this uh, study came with this conclusion. Uh, this paper was published in 2018. This paper concluded that subscapillary slide technique can be effectively used for the internal rotation contracture. And 29% uh, patients required additional post-operative intervention. This study was published in 2013. 
this study showed how age and condition of the joint affects post operative internal rotation uh, decrease that is congruent and age less than 2 years uh, this study was published in uh, jpo 2019 and uh, it concluded that um, 9 out of 20 patients underwent a derotational humeral osteotomy to improve midline function after anterior soft tissue release and tendon transfer surgery. This paper was published in 2019 of Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. This patient, um, this, uh, this publication compared the arthroscopic and uh, open arthroscopic and open release of internal rotation contraction and didn't found any significant result. This study uh, was published in Journal of Hand in 2022, and uh, it compared single versus double tendon transfer in C5, C6, C7 palsy, and consider performing one tendon transfer surgery in these cohort of patients to decrease further decreasing midline function, but uh, it was not a significant difference. This publication was published uh, in JPO by us. Uh, this uh, concluded that strength of internal rotation is maintained after minimal invasive subscapular is released. This publication was uh, published in uh, 2019. It concluded that anterior release technique shows comparable results with the posterior subscapular is release. And with the, we can do the anterior release with five, uh, five uh, only five millimeter incision. And uh, so it is not uh, Invasive. This publication was uh, published in 2015. It concluded that surgery improved passive external rotation, active abduction, and hand to neck function, but did not change the abduction contracture. So, we need to do some extra procedure for the abduction contracture, that is, putty sign. This publication was published in 2014, and uh, this reported a new surgical option with the rewarding results for the uh, humeral derotational osteotomy. We can do external fixation percutaneously and uh, cannot affect the deltoid. This publication was published in 2005 and uh, uh, effect this, uh, this was about effect of tendon transfers on the glenohumeral development by Peter Waters from Boston Children's Hospital. No, this leads to, this concluded that no profound glenohumeral remodeling occurs after tendon transfer surgery. And in 2010, Peter Waters um, came up with a different study and they said that joint reduction by arthroscopic or open techniques can lead to joint remodeling. And this, public, this publication was published in 2020 by Andrea Buer from Boston Children's Hospital. And came, she came up with joint reduction combined with tendon transfer can lead to remodeling. But without joint reduction, uh, glenohumeral uh, joint remodeling is not possible. This, uh, this paper was uh, read in con uh, one conference uh, in 2022, Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. Uh, they, uh, in, in this publication, it was also uh, showed that after reduction of the joint, glenohumeral remodeling occurs. This uh, publication was published in 2019 by Turkar Oskan from Turkey. They came up with the new technique, that is switch technique, to improve uh, re pronation and radial deviation in brachial plexus but palsy patients. And uh, here is the procedure. This publication was published in 2021 by Atkan Aydin from Turkey. They concluded that satisfactory postural and functional improvement can be achieved with the use of pronating mm. radius osteotomy for patients with severe supination contractures, not uh, flexible, not uh, less mild contractures. The mild contractures, they told bicep rerouting procedure is there, but there should not be tricep, uh, tri there should be not be tricep weakness. For the tricep weakness, we can do brachioradialis rerouting pronator plasty. This study was published in 2022 by Atkar Aydin. They came up with brachialis muscle to tricep transfer for the elbow extension and came up with significant improvement. This is a new technique for treating elbow flexion contracture. This is a modified OK procedure and has resulted in statistically significant improvement in the elbow flexion contracture. This publication was published in 2023. This is the long-term outcome of bicep rerouting and performed. This should be performed before passive pronation is reduced beyond uh, neutral. Uh, now the conclusion is, a surgeon must ask the following question before doing any procedure in brachial plexus blood palsy. Which muscle is functional or which is lost? What is the priority function to reestablish? 
which muscles are available among the available muscles which ones have adequate excursion and adequate tension and adequate line of pull and the best age for shoulder reconstruction is generally younger than the elbow reconstruction and future direction is we can do triplanar osteotomy with the help of cad software and with the software corrections were obtained in adduction extension and either internal or external rotation depending on the initial deformity and we can do glenoplasty also and motion analysis of shoulder is very important uh, to reach a, a good outcome thank you thank you Shina. so you finished uh -huh. before time and inviting mm -hmm. Parkhani sir for questions over to you yeah i'm not a brachial plexus uh, specialist but then uh, if you open uh, the new Campbell, let me see what is transferred, which muscle to which muscle. That entire thing has been removed and replaced by a neurotization. That is, they join this nerve to that nerve. So, uh, Dr. Shinam Bansal, is there any, are there any literature on neurotization where they join this nerve to that nerve in uh, Yes, this yes, there are a lot of... A lot and of, you have uh... not told us about it then? Yes, sir. There is very vast uh, literature. My topic was the was only sequelae, and uh, in the ah. sequelae, uh, we treat usually after uh, two years of age. So I didn't touch the neurotization part. Okay, so it is yours is beyond two years. So that is out of question. You want to say that? Yes, sir. From your review of literature, correct? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, it was about sequelae. So. Uh, so yours is actually. more than two years, so it will not matter as that's what you're trying sir, to say. We can, sir, we can relocate the joint and uh, mm. before that age so that we can prevent the glenohumeral deformity and mm. any bony deformity. Mm. But uh, nerve procedures are mainly uh, done at the age of uh, uh, six mm. months, nine months uh, yeah. or till one and a half year. Correct. So your review is beyond two years, so it doesn't matter here. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes, Thank you. I have no further questions because I'm not a brachial plexus specialist. Sandeep. Uh, yeah, Sheena, a lot of papers you presented. Uh, I think uh, there were too many papers, but I couldn't get a coherent message out of the whole review of literature. Because a lot of papers were just talking about uh, new techniques, new techniques, a new way, a minimally invasive way. Mm. Uh, more than that, what is the philosophy of either preventing or treating a contracture? One, does early soft tissue surgery result in remodeling or it doesn't? Because you gave two contradictory papers. Okay, one is where uh, Professor Waters has said that it doesn't remodel. So you do the bony procedure. Whereas you are saying subscap release is remodeling. And the follow-ups are so small oh. that no logical conclusion can be drawn yet on this whole thing. So long-term papers with authorities, uh, I found no as a compelling message coming out of uh, that for even a pediatric orthopedic surgeon from the literature as to this is what we should be doing. So what do you have to say about that? Uh, sir, Peter Waters sir, has two papers in 2005 and 2010. In 2005 paper, it is explained that uh, before relocation of joint, we, if we are doing only soft tissue procedure, before relocating the joint, it will not uh, lead to remodeling. But in 2000 paper, they proved that if we relocate the joint, in 2005, there was not a relocation of no, the joint. No, no, no. Take a minute. Take a minute. Read, that, read those papers again. When you do early surgery and relocate the joint with soft tissue, because at two years, there is no dislocation. It is still dysplasia with a contracture. Once you release the soft tissue and the joint sits back, does the glenohumeral articulation remodel is the question. Which later on he says it does not, so you add a glenoid osteotomy because it does not remodel. That was his opinion. That is why he started doing tendon transfer with the osteotomy simultaneous rather than like DDH, you do a reduction and the astabulum should improve. Whereas this is his contention was it doesn't improve, so add the osteotomy if the glenoid is retroverted. Now, simultaneously, you are publishing with uh, Maulin Bai and saying that subscap release minimally invasive and you are saying that it does remodel and there is glenohumeral remodeling. And no, th no, there is not enough follow-up for you to say that. 
sir, five years follow up is there. Yeah, so till maturity, you'll have to prove that there if and if there is remodeling, then do you think we should not be doing osteotomies? Ah, uh, what are the what means I, so I didn't that's what I'm saying. It's conflicting. What is the recommendation? Do we do an osteotomy or we don't? Sir, we should relocate the joint along with the soft tissue procedure. Exactly. So not, if we yes. if we relocate the joint with soft tissue. In spite of dysplasia, you say that the glenohumeral articulation will remodel and you don't need an osteotomy, correct? Is that what uh, you're trying sir, to say? Uh, sir, uh, please, uh, can you repeat? Yes, Sandeep, please repeat. I, yeah, I'm just asking you, if we, suppose there's an internal rotation contracture in a child with a trumpet sign positive and mm -hmm. on sir. radiology, the glenoid is dysplastic and the head is not dislocated, but it's looking backwards. Now I do yes, an anterior release. I do an yes, anterior sir. release and I do a tendon transfer. Yes, sir. Will this joint remodel? And I don't no. need to do an osteotomy or it will not remodel and I need to do the osteotomy. Sir, it will not remodel. We need to do osteotomy. Okay, that is what Waters said. Yes, sir. In 2010. And your paper, you are saying that it does remodel. Uh, sir, it depends on, sir, in the, in our paper also, we uh, relocated the joint. Correct. Relocation but of the joint is, can be... question is, is the joint remodeling? If there is glenohumeral dysplasia, you have not done osteotomy. My question is, does the glenohumeral joint dysplasia remodel once it is located and the soft sir, tissue balance is restored? Sir, remodeling will only occur if there is relocation of joint, either by osteotomy, either by closed method or either by any method. Dheeran Bhai, I think uh, I'm not clear. I think I'm clear in my mind what I'm asking. Yeah, okay. Whether uh, you Shinam, can frame it better for her. Yeah, Srinam, I just had a feeling that you mentioned so many articles. So my understanding is that when there are so many procedures for a problem, that says that none of the procedure is really effective. Is it what your, you understand and conclude from your research? Uh, sir, I concluded that uh, there is, uh, there should be, examination should be very uh, good. If we examine and we uh, define that there is a mild supination contracture or there is a, a rigid contracture, in rigid ones, we can do osteotomy. In flexible ones, like we have two things. If there is a, if there is a tricep weakness, then we can we have to do this procedure. If there is if there is no tricep weakness, then we need to do this procedure. So our examination sh uh, skills should be very definite in case of uh, brachial plexus. But if we are doing any procedure. Uh, in that kind of mus in any kind of particular muscle weakness, that procedure would not uh, will not give uh, good results uh, from this uh, paper. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Shinam, and uh, thank you, judges, for all the question and answers. So that was the final candidate, and we come to an end of this uh, event today. Uh, I'll just like to thank our sponsors today. I'll share the presentation. So, Mayor and Vita Biotics had sponsored the event today, Joint S and Neurolax. And we'll also like to invite all of you to Viroc this year. Yes, sir. So, thank you, uh, Dr. Sanjay Dhar, Ashok Sham, for inviting me and the others for this symposium and being a judge on this. It was very interesting and 
it was a nice thing for these junior people to do this research and come to some conclusions yes like uh, non union condyle and tendinopathy and 3d printing and tibial tuberosity osteotomy and brachial plexus very good i think it is a uh, sanjay i think i have to yes, congratulate sir. you for introducing this uh, some very new concept <laughs> yes which Thank i have not you. seen before this and i don't think the- that when you are the virox secretary you do you did that 20 years ago <laughs> yeah <laughs> very innovative very innovative very nice thank you thank you thank you sir thank you it is all basically let really these good. juniors come to the forefront and take over yes give yes. them proper space well, thank to... you sir yeah thank that's you. what happening in t20 is it not sanjay <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are replacing the seniors by new technology no it's it's good that bos is giving platform for youngsters and i can see that they are so confident ah, i don't yeah. think i was so confident at that age at all I, or had access to so many journals or having read so many i could talk in front of other people so yes. great initiative it's a very good idea thank yes. you thank you yes. sandeep yes. thank you thank you very much all of you to be there for this event yeah thank, thank you, you very much Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay, and bye. Bye. Good.